are two important facts to remember about our guest speaker today, which tell a remarkable story of dedication and accomplishment. Number one, our guest today started his career in the Commonwealth Edison Mailroom. Number two, today he is chairman and chief executive officer of ComEd. Our guest today runs a world-class utility, providing electric service delivery to roughly 3.7 million customers throughout, throughout Northern Illinois. Our guest today is the first African American to have been named president and now chairman of Commonwealth Edison. He is chairman of the board of trustees of the Adler Planetarium and Metropolitan Family Services. He also serves on the board of DePaul University, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, University of Chicago Hospitals, the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, Governor State University Foundation, the Illinois Manufacturers Association, the Big Shoulders Fund, and United Way of Metropolitan Chicago. Our guest today received his bachelor's and law degrees from DePaul University. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman and chief Execu executive officer of ComEd, Frank Clark. Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, my wife complains uh, that I'm away too much, and, and, and listening to Jay read off uh, the things that I'm involved with, maybe she has a point. Um, the good news is she's still complaining. Uh, so I take, that's right, you caught that. I take that as a compliment, and, and you know, I'll, I'll have to clean up my act. Um, I tell you, you never get tired of introductions. Um, people say they do, but you really don't. Uh, and, and someone you know, talks about your accomplishments and you know it sounds better and better. The older you get it sounds even better. Uh, and every now and then parts of it are really true. I really did start in the mail room and I really am chairman of ComEd. And <laughs> <laughs> after that I, I don't know. Um, I love this, this forum. I love this format. I love uh, being at the City Club of Chicago so I, I so respect Jay and what he has done over the years. Uh, he's a tremendous supporter of ComEd, and I know that he knows I'm a tremendous supporter of Jay Doherty and everything he does in this great city of ours. What you're going to hear me do over the next 15 minutes or so, although I got a lot of cards here, and I didn't time this, but uh, if I see myself going too long, I'll speed up or cut off some of the cards. But uh, what you're going to hear me do uh, is what I love doing most, and it's, it's use examples through people as much as I can to make the points that I would like to make. Um, I stand here uh, as the chairman of ComEd uh, because John Rowe, uh, the chairman and CEO, CEO of Exelon, uh, believed in me uh, and gave me the opportunity. And I am forever in his debt. Uh, I also stand here as chairman of ComEd because a gentleman who has been working with me for 35 of my 41 years at ComEd uh, joined me in partnership decades ago uh, and time and time and time again have has made my life uh, so much better, first for his personal friendship, but also because he's real good at what he does. Uh, and he has made me a lot, uh, appear a lot better than perhaps I really am. Uh, and that gentleman is John T. Hooker. Stand up, John. Next to my wife and children, I owe a great deal to John Hooker. I always, always want to acknowledge that. So for the next few minutes, what are you going to hear me talk about uh, are ComEd's customers, ComEd employees, and ComEd's commitment, my personal commitment, to the civic, social, and cultural structure of this great metropolitan center, the great city of Chicago, and indeed all of northern Illinois. Like the city club, ComEd is a vital part of Chicago. You know, I'd like to consider ComEd as part of the fabric of the community, enhancing the quality of life of all of our customers, 
we're headquartered here in Chicago. We've been a part of Chicago for more than 100 years. And our history is steeped in commitment, service, and community involvement. And I mentioned to you that I wanted to just address and acknowledge the many, many people at ComEd that make our company, I believe, a very good company, and one day perhaps even a great company. I've already talked about John Hooker. Uh, and in the introduction, as he went around, Jay mentioned Barry Mitchell, ComEd's new president. Um, prior to that, he was actually the CFO of Exelon, and he brings such strong financial strength to the ComEd team. Uh, but there are a few other people. Now, there are more people around the room than I can name. Uh, and I, we, when you do this, inevitably, someone that you should have mentioned, you don't. But, you know, I do the best I can. And so I'm going to mention some, because, you know, I don't get the opportunity to stand and, and acknowledge people in front of an audience who have done so much. Um, and in no particular order, uh, I'll start with the uh, lady who uh, doesn't, go at home, go, doesn't go to home at home at night sometimes. I catch her in the office all night long because she's trying to finish a project for me, um, where I'm sort of easygoing uh, and not necessarily undisciplined, but, you know, I'm, I'm relaxed. Uh, she is not. Uh, and because of that, many things that need to be done and done well get done and get done very well. And that's Rita Stoles. Rita? And I've been at Comet so long, most of the people I started with have left. So I'm, it's always a pleasure to, to still see people who have been around a while. It makes me, uh, you know, just to feel good to know that they continue to care about me as I do them. People like Bill Voller, who's sitting in the audience there. <laughs> Bill uh, heads up our sales organization, our customer organization, and just, I think, does an outstanding job. Uh, and I saw Arlene Jarisak sitting. Uh, you don't ever want to negotiate with Arlene. Um, but if you need someone to negotiate for you and, and to deal with the most complicated technical matters, you send Arlene in. Uh, and the job gets done well. Uh, and I, I've uh, been working very closely with her for so many years. I'm very appreciative of what Arlene has, has done and continues to do for, for ComEd. Uh, Steve Sullivan, uh, I say yes a lot. Uh, and I have no problem with that. But sometimes I say yes more than I should, and I should have a problem with it. But you know who gets the problem? Steve Solomon. <laughs> and, and, and Steve makes my yes is real, and he, and he makes sure that I do what I say that I'm going to do, and the company is represented well. Uh, and uh, everywhere we turn, uh, we try to make a positive difference in, in this great uh, community. Uh, I also saw Tabrina Davis sitting over in the corner, uh, Tabrina uh, actually, I think, came to us from the Chicago public school system, uh, and she handles um, um, most of our external um, uh, communications uh, and um, our interactions with the media. Uh, and um, she tries, even though sometimes it's hard for her, to uh, get me out and uh, be in public forums, um, particularly those uh, that air very early in the morning. Um, I may be a utility executive, but I'm not a morning person. Uh, and uh, they, 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 they're constantly getting me uh, to uh, make these uh, 7 o'clock and 7.30 appearances. Uh, and um, uh, through a lot of encouragement, you know, it really either calls me and wakes me up or someone comes to get me, and I, I get there and I do it. But Tabrina has uh, done very well in uh, making me, again, appear knowledgeable and even sensible uh, most of the time, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, since I really have a speech to give, I should really get to it. Um, one other person, though, uh, who I was sitting next to and talking to today um, has been a source of uh, advice, uh, guidance, and support uh, for a number of years. Uh, his, his, his wisdom uh, and, and the interactions of this uh, great metropolis uh, is what I appear, and that's Tom Donovan. I certainly want to say thank you for that. And for the many of you that I'm looking at right now, uh, Irma, Todd, uh, that I have not done you justice, please forgive me. Uh, and at another time, I will do you even more justice. Okay. 
getting back to things that I should talk to you about. We're not just an energy delivery company uh, with 3.7 million customers. I like to believe that we are major supporters of the community. We recognize that our business extends beyond maintaining wires and poles. We play an important role in helping to build and maintain the communities we serve. I remember one experience that drives the point home. About a year ago, John Rowe and uh, I uh, went out uh, on a tour bus with an organization called Night Ministry. Some of you are familiar with the organization. I can just say that they do outstanding help providing assistance to the city's homeless. And this is a great city, but we have quite a few homeless people. Well, John and I spent probably four or five hours at night on the bus going around from one location to another. And principally what they do is they provide basic first aid services, they bring food, soft drinks, water to people who are living in the street. And I tell you, when you go from one stop to another, I don't quite know how the folks know the schedule, but obviously they do. There are dozens of people lined up waiting for the bus to receive that help. Uh, John and I were both impressed uh, and profoundly touched and moved uh, by that experience. And as a result of that, uh, we uh, talked to a number of our employees, mm -hmm. and one of, the, uh, uh, of our employees, a lady by the name of Cheryl Hyman, uh, uh, volunteered to join the Board of Night Ministry, and we've been working closely with that organization ever since then. Cheryl's uh, involved in major community work, and in fact, I know she's out there doing that now, so she's not with us to stand up and be recognized. Uh, but this is a wonderful organization uh, that does a service that most of you don't see because it's night ministry. Experiences like this remind us, remind me, of our responsibility as corporate citizens. That's why in the last two years, ComEd, now it's going to sound like I'm bragging, but I'm not. Well, maybe I am. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is, is emphasize both need and commitment. Uh, in the last two years, ComEd has contributed nearly $13 million to nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to supporting Chicago area communities. And I'm very proud of that, and I know that even more needs to be done. One of these organizations is especially dear to my heart, Metropolitan Family Services. They've been helping families who need help for nearly 150 years. Um, and if we're going to build the next generation of, of leaders, a strong family foundation is crucial. <coughs> Metropolitan Family Services provides violence prevention, medical health counseling, and child welfare services, just to name a bit, a few, to uh, families in need. And Dr. Richard Jones, the president and CEO, is with us today. Richard, please stand up and be recognized. I tell you, when you see these social organizations, and you actually see the people they, they help, and you meet them, uh, you, 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 uh, and many of you, I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here, I know that, but it is profoundly moving because you're really doing something good. Uh, in, in the world of corporate executives, where the in rounds of the world stand out, uh, it's good to find yourself participating and doing something good. Uh, something that benefits society and something that benefits you know, the customers that you serve. It takes strong families to raise leaders, but a strong education is also vital. It's also a vital ingredient. ComEd is deeply involved in Chicago schools. For example, we provide financial resources, in-kind donations, and employees who volunteer their time at four schools in Humble Park. A partner in this initiative is BUILD, that's B-U-I-L-D an organization whose mission is to help at-risk youth to develop positive life skills and alternative to gangs, drugs, and violence. Freddie Calisso, I hope I got that right or close enough, he's the, executive, uh, he's the executive director of Bill, and he's here today. Freddie, please stand up. <laughs> the reason I do this is that there are so many leaders in this room I get an opportunity uh, to focus in on things that I personally consider very important, but I also get the opportunity to introduce these folks to a larger audience, people who I know and whose generosity I know. Uh, and by singling out these organizations, because there are many more, it's, just, it's another way to expand their network and their outreach. And Freddie, your leadership 
uh, and the quality of your service is well recognized and greatly appreciated. In addition to education, arts, culture, arts and culture are also vital parts of our corporate giving. Uh, we are proud supporters of the Sabo Museum of African American <coughs> History, the Mexican Fine Arts Museum, and the Puerto Rican Arts Alliance, and Goodman Theater, to name a few. And all of these institutions help enrich the culture of our diverse community. It's not just ComEd that supports community. It's also individual contributions from our employees. It starts with the leadership at the top. You know, as I mentioned before, John Rowe. John Rowe is chairman of Exelon. Exelon is the parent company of ComEd. What you may not know is that John Rowe and his wife, Jean, are actively involved in a number of philanthropic efforts dedicating their personal time and financial support to many causes. One example is their support of the Pope John Paul II School on Chicago's West Side, a school that was facing its doors being closed. Uh, their support helped the school to eliminate its debt and to remain open to students. Jean spends time at the school tutoring children in math and reading. Recently, 20 ComEd employees dedicated their time to restore furniture for the victims of Hurricane Katrina. Three of, three of these employees drove hundreds of miles to donate the furniture to the local United Way in Lafayette, Louisiana. Finally, Cicero uh, Gambina, a member of our IT team, gives up two nights a week to help Bronzeville residents with their taxes. Now, he does this on his own time and without cost. And this is tax time, and there are a lot of people that need help. Cicero, are there? Stand up, Cicero. <laughs> Above all, ComEd employees are dedicated to providing service to our 3.7 million customers. What was once a luxury 100 years ago is an essential part of life today. The explosive growth in technology all depends on electricity. We live in larger homes. We watch flat screen TVs. We surf the internet and we listen to music on large, highly technical stereo systems. And we have gadgets that only the children can control. <laughs> None of this would be happening without a reliable source of electricity. I'm glad you're getting my little subtle jokes. <laughs> Sometimes they're so subtle nobody gets them. <laughs> to make sure the electricity is there when you need it, ComEd manages a massive electrical system. Some examples. We have 82,000 miles of transmission and distribution lines. That's enough to circle the globe three times. Now, there's you know, several engineers out there, and someone will go do this math and tell me I'm wrong, but they, <laughs> Tabrina wrote it, so I think it's probably true. <laughs> 1.4 million poles, 570,000 distribution transformers, and over 1,000 substations. Thousands of people in the field working every community in Northern Illinois 24 hours a day, and hundreds of call center representatives who hopefully when you call them are courteous, thoughtful, and most importantly, resolve your issues. In providing reliable service, ComEd must wage war with our number one enemy. I'm pausing now for dramatic effect because I'm not sure when I say our number one enemy what comes to people's mind. I don't want you to say anything. I'll say. It's Mother Nature. Nature. Our cruise battle, ice. I wonder what you were thinking, though. Our cruise battle, ice, snow, tornadoes, high winds, rain, lightning, and extreme heat and cold. Imagine climbing a pole in the middle of the night in an ice storm to restore power. We have hundreds, hundreds of employees that are willing to do that. To respond to these challenges and maintain our system, we are constantly upgrading our system. And since 2001, we've, invest, we've invested more than $3 billion in that system. These investments have paid dividends. Outages are down 44% since 1998. And when outages do occur, 
ComEd is restoring power in less than half the time it took several years ago. We have also strengthened our system with two major substations, added new technology, and upgraded our circuits. While we've improved our performance, we've also cut our costs, and we've become more efficient. The only way that you can survive a nine-year rate freeze and a 20% rate reduction, I might add, on, for residential customers, is to become more resourceful. We've had to make tough choices in the last few years, but they resulted in great value for our customers. Sabrina, you did a good job. <laughs> We've also met the need of a growing service territory during this nine-year freeze. Our communities could continue to grow with more homes, bigger homes, placing more demand on our system. From the transformation of the West Loop to the expansions of suburbs like Huntley and Plainville, with every new home, every new condominium, every new hospital or business, ComEd must meet that need. That means morning, noon, or night, summer, winter, spring, or fall. Whenever you flip that switch, you expect ComEd to instantly be able to meet that demand. And that is our responsibility. We also partner with our customers to help improve their ability to compete. One example is our work with Eli Cheesecake Company in Chicago. And most of you have probably eaten there. I find the food excellent. We partnered with Eli, with Eli Team and the Chicago Industrial Rebuild Program to develop a comprehensive plan that reduced their energy costs. This allowed them to improve their bottom line. We also conducted similar projects with a range of customers, such as the Atla Planetarium. This is another organization that's very, very important to me. And the Executive Vice President and COO of, uh, of Adler, Margaret uh, Malek, is here. Margaret, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> let, me, let me do a little 10-second plug for the Adler. Uh, we're at the very, very end of the, of the uh, museum campus. And people, by the time they go through the shed and the field museum and look at the lakefront, they get tired. And their legs don't carry them all the way down to the Adler. You need to get down there. It is just a wonderful facility. And I'll tell you, I'm biased. I don't know a better view in the, in the Chicago area than standing at the Adler looking across the lake. It is absolutely magnificent. And by the way, you learn a lot. <laughs> the Adler is going to be the new center for math and science. The Adler Planetarium, under the leadership of some very, very, very dedicated board members, and Paul Knappenberger and Margaret and others, uh, are going to develop, with your help and your financial support, the next expansion and the next set of exhibits that are going to stimulate and increase the awareness of young folks towards math and science. That's another talk, and, and let me get back to what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> but walk down to the Adler and walk in there. And ComEd continues to evolve with the changing needs and expectations of our customers. You know, it's, it's a real art. I really appreciate stand-up uh, talk show folks. You know, you get off on a tangent and you get completely off your text and you have to transition back to it. You know, and I just read Ann and it didn't fit anything, but you know. <laughs> you just, I, that's how I feel about it too. You just keep on going, <laughs> you know. People are always much more understanding than we think. Anyway, today we, and I guess this is, this is sort of the, the, the drum roll for ComEd. Uh, today, ComEd is the energy delivery company only. Energy delivery, distribution. Ten years ago, we were in charge of the electric service from soup to nuts. Today, we no longer own power plants. Instead, we purchase power from others. Now, this is really important. ComEd is a distribution company only. I'm responsible for the wires and the poles and delivering electricity to your home. But I must go out into the marketplace to buy the supply. So why the change? ComEd transformed itself because the Illinois, because Illinois made a fundamental shift in 1997. That's when the Illinois General Assembly restructured the electric industry in this state. This is part of a national movement, however. The basic, philosophy, the basic philosophy is very simple. The belief is that 
We want to restructure power generation supply to be competitive while delivery remains regulated. The Illinois law held that developing a market for electricity supply provides more efficiency, greater innovation, lower customer risk, and disciplined prices. And I believe that competition works. Now, for the issues in front of us today, this part of my talk is just usually important, and hopefully I communicated re reasonably well. ComEd is a delivery company only. ComEd, the utility, owns no generation. ComEd, the utility, Frank Clark, the chairman and CEO, Barry Mitchell, the president, we have to go into the marketplace to purchase that power. And whatever we pay for that power, in order for ComEd to remain financially viable, we have to pass that purchase price on to our consumers. That has, very simple thing that I just said, has produced a fair amount of controversy. Thanks to restructuring today, competition does exist in Illinois. There is a vibrant wholesale electricity market. This fall, ComEd will leverage its buying power in the wholesale market to get the best price for our customers. The ICC has approved a new method to purchase energy on behalf of our customers. It's called a reverse auction, which simply means the low bidder wins. Now, you may read about the debate over how we will purchase power and the need for a rate increase. Well, there are two main reasons. First, our cost to deliver power has increased during the nine-year rate freeze, such as costs such as health care, salaries, pensions, capital to continue investing in our system. Second, the cost of power is increasing. Electricity costs have risen nationally due to higher fuel costs. And by that I mean coal, oil, natural gas. These are the fuel sources needed to generate electricity. Those prices have risen, and it lags a bit, but it always increases the commodity cost itself, the supply cost. That's what I'm faced with. When I go into the market and I have to buy this power, I have to buy this power from generators who have had their costs skyrocket because of both the national and international events involving oil and natural gas. It's important to keep rates and rate increases in their proper context. Consider this. ComEd's residential rates were cut 20% and have been frozen for the last nine years. Today, ComEd customers on average pay, this is also important, 8.6 cents per kilowatt hour. 8.6, less than 9 cents a kilowatt hour. While New York, for, I'm using just examples, while New York pays 18 cents a kilowatt hour. LA, San Francisco, and our sister city, Philadelphia, pay about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Your price for electricity in northern Illinois is low compared to virtually any other major metropolitan center. Think of your own line of work. How many of you are offering your customers prices that are below 1995 levels? Well, that is exactly what ComEd has been doing and, frankly, cannot continue. I realize the impact of any rate increase on customers who have had a, a rate freeze for a decade creates problems. And what we've done, we have offered what we call a safety net plan to cap rate increases to no more than a single digit, to no more than a single percentage in the next three years. So in each of the next three years, no more than a single percentage increase is what we're putting on the table to phase in the impact of the rate increase. We will, and there will also be a deferral amount uh, at the end of that time, because if you don't get it all up front and you defer it, you create a deferral. Uh, and we're proposing collecting that deferral the following three years, so it's like a six-year plan. We believe that this will help customers in the transition from the current artificially low rates to cost-based or market-based rates. In conclusion, my over 40, in my over 40-year career, I've had the opportunity to witness the companies transform itself. We have evolved from changes in the industry and rising customer expectation. We have achieved much, much that I'm proud of, but I'm also looking forward to an even better future. I'm proud of our record 
I'm proud of our employees, and I'm proud to serve the city of Chicago and Northern Illinois. And I thank you for your time and attention, and if you have questions. There's a microphone. Uh, if, if you would like to come up and ask questions, I'll be pleased to take a few. Just state your name if you're going to ask a question. It's all on cable TV so everybody can hear it. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Clark, it's pretty evident from your articulate remarks that diversity has served the executive suite of Commonwealth Edison pretty well. Could you comment about diversity in procurement? Yes. Commonwealth Edison. I can go back to, uh, to the 1970s when I actually managed the ComEd, um, we called it at that, day, in that day, the Minority Purchasing Program. Uh, and I remember we, when we hit our first million dollar mark and that was staggering at that time. Um, over the uh, last several decades, I've seen that number grow to the tens of millions and indeed uh, even more. Um, I'm proud of what ComEd has done in promoting diversity among suppliers uh, with professional services. Uh, and uh, that in the diversity obviously includes uh, African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, and women. Uh, but there's, uh, we, we spend you know, a billion dollars plus. It's a, a lot of room uh, to do more. We're conscious of it. I strive to do, uh, to do more and to do better. But we have a record that I can stand up and look you in the eye and say that uh, we are indeed proud of it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Clark, my name is Judith Reese. I'm an attorney and I'm a member of the City Club. I realize this isn't your job, but I had a <clears throat> unexplained hiccup on my electric bill and I can get no one to talk to me about it. Did you bring someone with you today? I, you know, I, I mentioned to you that you know they 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 never allow me out without without escorts and competent people, uh, and uh, the room is full of them. But one is standing. You're, you're standing right next to her. You know, Rita. Would you take care? Of her? Yes. She will. She will actually talk to you and resolve your problem. Yes, my electric bill is so low, I'm afraid that it's, it's wrong. So I, I shouldn't even say my name. <laughs> you, you're you're going to be in our next commercial. Okay. <laughs> so, so, the question that I have, it, it might be stupid, but I don't understand something. Electricity is, a, and, and by the way, to everyone in the room, I don't work for ComEd. I have no contract with ComEd, because you'll think this question just sounds so pro-ComEd. But why would anyone use gas, which is so expensive? When electricity yeah. is so much less. I don't, I don't, and we were talking about it at my table. We don't understand. I mean, I have friends who have these monthly heating bills of $1,000, and my electric bill is like $100 a month or so. Well, Why do people use gas then? Well, that's a, here. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> don't worry. I'm trained to be diplomatic. Um, a number of folks that work for both, oh, uh, both Energy. I'm going to say something nice about them. A number of folks that work for both NICOR and People's Energy are in the room. Um, and you remember what I said before, ComEd is the delivery company, so, is, so are People's and NICOR, the delivery companies. They don't actually own the gas. They also have to buy the gas from, from the uh, uh, big pipelines. So the international and national issues that have driven the cost of oil, I mean, you sit at the pump. The, the, the gasoline pump um, uh, and, and coal and, and um, uh, natural gas are frankly beyond any one company's ability to control. Um, in the case of ComEd, when I go and I buy the electricity from, a, uh, from suppliers through some competitive process, whatever the market clearing price is and this auction that we're putting in place to drive that, get that uh, to the lowest possible uh, component, I'm going to pass that on with no markup. I, I don't earn anything on that. Whatever I pay, I pass on. So if you see the supply piece of the bill go up, and we're going to separate because I want people to know, I'm responsible for, for delivery and hold me accountable for what I, by the way, I'm asking for a 6% rate increase after a decade. On the, but that's just the delivery piece. And I'm 6%, I'm 6%, 6 so if you have, um, the average customer, someone tell me, it's about a $70 a month bill. John Hooker, you, you're sneaking out. I'm going to have some. <laughs> <laughs> I might have something else to say to you. <laughs> you know, I'm starting, I'm starting to quote numbers here. I might need some help. But, um, you know, it's 3 or $4 a month. But, you know, I, 
the, the answer to your question is, is, is better answered by the folks who actually are in the business and, and the gas business. I'm not. But I do understand the issue. And the issue is whatever they pay for the supply in order for them to stay in business, and you want to be able to buy gas next year, you know, get to I pay the bill. It, but I'm saying with gas prices so high now, why wouldn't people just switch to electric? Why would you pay the gas price? I'm, I'm happy for any customer that wants to be all electric, but I'm, I'm, I'm not unhappy with, it, with, with the, uh, the multitude of customers who um, like, frankly, heating with gas. I mean, I used to have heat pumps in my home, and, and that's a way of heating with electricity. And my wife complained bitterly that it was always cold because it, it, it felt different, whereas when we, you know, went to gas, <laughs> <laughs> she felt more heat. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a question from the audience. Alderman of Sarasville, I forgot one person. Great public servant and great city club member, Rita Mullins. Where are you, Rita? Where did you go? Stand up there. Thank you very much. Let your church. Alderman of Sarasville, come on. The reason you use gas is you do any cooking at all. Gas is a better fuel to cook. You can't, you can't cook. I don't cook. I have people who cook. <laughs> I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can if you can hear the alderman, but, but the alderman gave a a, a, a very sensible uh, reason why you choose gas, uh, and uh, it, it has to do with the quality of uh, the heat uh, that you get from the uh, I guess from the uh, gas ranges, etc. Uh, sounded sounded good to me, uh, and you know I'm. It's the same with washing clothes. <laughs> alderman, alderman, would you like to come up here and take the mic, sir? <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> this has nothing. This has nothing to do with you, but you ought to use your influence to get the power companies to convert more to wind and sun. Okay. And then, then the prices would fall. Repeat it, sir. Uh, the alderman, uh, uh, in his unique diplomatic way, uh, <laughs> has stated uh, that ComEd, uh, and I'm sure he means all the utilities in the state, uh, electric ones anyway, uh, ought to uh, depend less on the fossil fuels, the coal, the oil, uh, and, and natural gas, uh, and depend more, or at least utilize more, and develop more of what we call renewable uh, energy resources, uh, a wind, uh, solar, um, and I'm sure energy efficiency plays into that role. And I can answer that question very simply. I agree with you, Alderman. We need to do more of that, and indeed we are. Uh, one of our experts, Arlene Jurisak, who I mentioned earlier, uh, has uh, just completed a round of discussions with, with folks on just that subject, and I think that you'll see that we're making uh, even greater effort uh, to do that. Uh, I have asked the administration to put windmills on the breakwater, and they said you're all wind. <laughs> well, Alderman, the Alderman says something about being all wind, uh, and <laughs> I'm just going to move on, you know. <laughs> I have to go before him time and time again. One final question, Frank. Uh, Why don't you read that? Yes. And then, uh, 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 this question that Jay gave me is that uh, he, he thinks I need to talk a little bit more about the reverse auction because that's a concept that is, is not commonly understood. Uh, and in a nutshell, when you do a, a normal auction process, you have you know, 10 bidders and uh, the, they're bidding for some commodity and you're looking for the high bid. And that's what you see. Then you sell your, your commodity at the high price. A reverse auction is just the opposite of that. You have 10 bidders, they go to a round of bidding, and each round you get a lower and lower price because until you get to the lowest possible price with the maximum number of people bidding who can completely meet the supply that you need, meet the load demand, uh, the, the load that I need to serve customers, once that clears at the lowest possible denominator and all the loads being served, whatever round that is, as you keep going down and going down, I mean, I, all right, you start out with a number at $100, and everyone wants to do it to serve our load, the combat load at $100. Okay. Then you say, if you do it at 100 will you do it at 90 A couple will drop out, but a lot will still stay in because they think they're still making money. And you still got more bidders and supply than you need. So you go to another round. You say, well, if you do it at 90 how many of you will do it at 80 At some point, you will have exactly this, the right number of suppliers meeting all your load at the lowest possible price, reverse auction. Uh, it's the concept of some very, very bright people, some are in the room like Arlene and Ann, uh, our prominent jury and Bill McNeil who are not. Uh, we believe and the commission has agreed that it is a process that will result and help 
provide the lowest possible costs through a competitive process uh, to our customers. Uh, it has been more than a pleasure. Uh, you've been a great audience. Invite me back again. I have a lot of stories to tell that I didn't get to yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. On behalf of the City Club of Chicago Board of Directors, there's a City Club mug and a City Club room. City Club membership. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.